Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to day two of GDC's uh, Greek NPL Summit. Uh, we hope you were able to tune in yesterday and enjoyed uh, the first day. Uh, we've got a great day lined up today as well uh, for the second day, and we're going to kick things off with um, a very important market uh, aside from the Greek market, which is Cyprus. Uh, we've got a really great panel lined up today uh, with experts from different uh, fields of the financial sector, uh, each with their own uh, distinctive inputs. So I'm looking forward to this panel and it's my pleasure to hand over uh, after welcoming everybody to uh, Petros Ionidis uh, of BDO Advisory who will be leading the discussion today. So uh, Petros, thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Good morning, everybody. I would like to welcome everybody to uh, today's event and specifically to the topic Cypriot market drill down session, whereby our objective is to provide you with details in relation to the Cyprus market. And more specifically, we are going to cover three main topics. The first one is to cover the current status of the NPL market in Cyprus. The second one is to cover the current legislation in place in relating to the NPL management locally. And the third one, which is also considered very important, we are going to cover the relevant tools that can be used by an investor in order to invest into NPLs in the local market. And we are going to elaborate on the local legislation that is available in Cyprus. Allow me to introduce our distinguished guests and experts that are participating in today's event, which all of them have considerable experience in this area. And I'm going to make a brief introduction for each one of them and each one of them can elaborate during this, this, his session in order to, to, to elaborate on his topic. First of all, I would like to introduce Mihalis Tsangaridis. Mihalis, he's a senior portfolio manager at Delphi Partners. He's a real estate expert with deep understanding of the NPL market in Cyprus, and he's going to cover the first area that I mentioned beforehand. Nicolas Kiriagidis, he's a legal advisor, a partner at Harris Kiriagidis Law Firm, an expert in Cyprus banking law, and he has also relevant experience in the recent legislation that's currently taking place. Evdogia Stavraghi, she's a director at Alter Domus, and she mainly deals with funds and finance vehicles that allowing investors to invest into Cyprus having different investment structures. Michalis, I will welcome you to this session and I would like to address the first question to you in order to make an introduction in relation to the Cyprus NPL market to provide to our audience a brief understanding of the current status of the NPL market, the key services that currently are in the market, and also if you can provide us some feedback in relation to the recent transactions that have taken place and how the whole market has evolved the recent years in order to provide to our audience an understanding how the market has evolved and how we expect the market to evolve in the near future, which is important for investors to understand how the market is going to evolve and what investment opportunities are currently in place. Please, let, Hello, me, Petros. let me have yeah. your thoughts, please. Thank you for the introduction, first of all, um, and for your kind words. Indeed, the questions that you have posed, uh, I will try to cover them throughout this session. And hopefully we will provide some value to, to the audience and give them a snapshot of the situation um, in Cyprus. Um, so, uh, first of all, I would like to, to uh, introduce myself 
a bit further. Uh, as you said, I am a, a civil engineer. I was involved in property development and this fueled my passion for real estate. And after a certain point, I understood that um, uh, real estate is very uh, intrinsically related to the NPL market. And I, I saw that the future in Cyprus of uh, real estate or uh, a large uh, portion of it will be intrinsically connected to, to the NPLs. Um, following that, uh, over the past few years, I've been involved in, um, through my, uh, our company Delphi Partners, um, assisting financial institutions and investors in the purchase and, of uh, NPL portfolios. And after that, in the management and disposal of real estate owned asset pools and portfolios. We've advised both uh, buy side and sell side uh, NP uh, transactions. Uh, now, um, in order to give uh, an overview of what's happening, I, think, I believe it's useful to see uh, what, how the NPLs um, came into our lives in Cyprus, when this happened and where we stand today. Um, to, to help me do that, I think it would be useful uh, to show um, a presentation that we've prepared. where we can see that uh, starting from uh, 2013 and by the end of 2014, the NPLs within the banking system reached 27 billion. And this represented a percentage of about 48% of total uh, exposures. This was uh, a big hazard for Cypriot banks. It was a problem that needed to be solved. Uh, over the uh, first years following 2013, so 2014 up to 17, we saw a small reduction, which was mainly facilitated by the banks uh, handling these uh, exposures themselves. And uh, the reduction was, um, um, was not that significant. And uh, it seemed that for the banks, there was no light at the end of the tunnel. And then in 2018, we can see a huge drop. Uh, what happened there? Uh, that was when uh, the, the market was mature and the conditions existed in, in Cyprus to start the sale of NPL portfolios. So we see that from uh, the end of 2017 up to the end of 2018, we had a, a 10 billion reduction within the banking system. And uh, from 43.7% uh, ratio of NPLs over total loans, uh, we went to 30.3%. And today we are at 5 billion and 17.7%. So now I think the banks do see a light at the end of the tunnel. But um, there is no magic solution. And, these loans did not magically disappear, of course. Um, we see that in 2017, we had the, the first uh, sale of an NPL portfolio with Project Zeus. It was a small transaction testing the waters. It was followed by Project Semeli uh, in 2018, which was larger. And then we had the biggest transaction uh, in 2018, which caused uh, a big drop from 2017 to 18, uh, Project Helix One. Uh, followed, it was followed by two smaller projects, and then we had Helix Two in 2020, Project Marina, and um, uh, two phase and uh, the second phase of uh, Helix Two. So these sales really helped. Uh, the banks remove uh, non-performing loans from their uh, uh, from their balance sheets, and they brought new players in the market. They brought uh, 
other financial organizations, other financial institutions that were more um, experienced, I have to, to say, and uh, brought more, more tools and they were more flexible in, the, in handling these uh, non-performing loans. Um, so we see that the, a very efficient way to improve the banking sector in Cyprus is the sale of NPLs in bulk. And this, this is a trend that will continue. Uh, we are involved in the preparation of, another, of more portfolios within the next 12 months. They have an average value between a uh, total value between four to four and a half billion. Um, we are working at the moment assisting the sell side. Uh, so we know there will be even more transactions in the future. It's, this is a, now an established way to deal with uh, NPLs. So we expect uh, more movement in the near future. And yes. we anticipate to see more transactions in the market where okay. there, there could be certain opportunities. So investors, they need to, to be ready and assess, assess such opportunities. Definitely. Um, uh, well, the, the investors uh, will take into consideration mainly two factors. They will take into consideration the purchase price. So um, Cypriot banks have to uh, be very careful with the, with the purchase price. And also they, they want to know how the collaterals will, perf will perform in the market. So what price they can get for the collaterals and how quickly they can recover that value. Correct. And this is a topic, I think, that will be covered by our legal advisor at the next session, whereby it will explain how the foreclosure law has been amended and has facilitated the securities to be more liquid and more transparent in order to assess and also to increase recoveries and improve the values of their portfolios. Yes, Petros, definitely. Uh, the legislation is critical in such considerations and um, potential buyers do take into consideration the legislation uh, around uh, NPLs. Uh, as you very correctly said, uh, the uh, legislation uh, around foreclosures is very important. As it's, it's a very important tool for, um, for the recovery. So um, investors will be looking into that and uh, Nicolas will elaborate further uh, regarding that. So after these sales, we now have this picture in Cyprus, whereby uh, five, around 5 billion of NPLs remain within the banking system. 6.6 6 billion are owned by credit acquiring companies which I have listed uh, at the right. And 6.3 is owned by Gedibes. Um, Gedibes is, um, is what, what is left after the, the restructuring of, uh, of the Cyprus Cooperative Bank. And um, the profits from Gedibes are repaying the government that uh, supported uh, the cooperative bank. So at the moment, we see that we have around 18 billion of NPLs in the market in Cyprus. Now, these NPLs are, I mean, in order to manage these NPLs, uh, you need a lot of expertise, a lot of different skills. So um, we've seen different approaches in the market. We've seen owners of NPLs service their uh, portfolio themselves, such as Gordian. And we've seen other uh, owners using servicers. Uh, we have uh, Do Value uh, servicing 3.2 billion uh, of uh, NPLs for, for Alpha Bank. Traset is uh, used from Astro Bank. Altamira for KDBs, APS for, uh, for the Hellenic Bank. Um, and 
what what they bring into into the game is um, this array of skills that is needed because you don't just need the bankers to restructure the loans. You also need um, advisors. You need consultants around real estate. Uh, you need surveyors. Um, so uh, it's it's a very complex um, business. I think I will put it into a, 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 another perspective on the basis that as long as the, and the time passes and the NPLs become even more difficult because more difficult borrowers stay behind, I think more innovative solutions and more complicated solutions are needed. And uh, the establishment of services in, in Cyprus from different jurisdictions, bringing various expertise, I think it will be helpful in order to alleviate the problem because they are bringing expertise and other ideas which are helpful to, to, to find solutions. And, and something I think it's what we can discuss uh, during your uh, next slides of your presentation in order to, to show to our audience that various solutions are applicable to various types of borrowers depending on their viability and their cooperativeness. That is very true. Um, we knew we have the traditional tools being used, uh, such as uh, restructuring, DFAS, litigation, foreclosures, um, which are very useful. They, they are each, um, they have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, um, our fellow speakers will go into further detail into those. But as you said, we have expertise that uh, was brought with all the with the servicers and the investors, and uh, uh, well, up to a point, we we got um, we we got their expertise, and up to another point, we had to rush and uh, and catch up to them. So we see. Uh, innovative solutions and we see uh, the application of technology uh, currently we see uh, tools like um, uh, e-auctions we see um, real estate analytics taking uh, uh, steps ahead and being used heavily at the moment in uh, in cyprus um, we see uh, platforms, uh, advanced platforms being used and being developed in Cyprus, and also our new recovery tools, um, such as mortgage to rent that have been included here. This is a tool that has been applied in other jurisdictions with success. And in Cyprus, we know currently that KDBES is discussing with the Ministry of Finance for its application. Uh, this it's not random that it's KDBES that um, is uh, was the first to start uh, discussing uh, using this tool uh, due to the nature of their borrowers. So what what mortgage to rent is um, basically the 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 borrower voluntarily uh, gives ownership of uh, of their home. And they remain as um, as renters uh, in the um, in the property. So uh, the the lender now can sell the asset, the property, to um, to buyers who are interested mostly for investment and not for a place to stay. Um, so they they can get a return. Now. This tool is mostly um, aimed towards borrowers who cannot repay, obviously, their loan. So now we have the issue where if they cannot repay their loan, how can they pay market rent for their house? And um, this is where uh, the, the government could be involved, and this is where the discussions are, are being made, where 
potentially the government can subsidize uh, part or a percentage of the rent so that the property will retain its value to an investor. Uh, so we see that, um, I, I think another important uh, uh, take um, from this is that the Cypriot government is, um, is trying to help. Uh, they, are, they are not, um, they don't have much uh, resistance towards new ideas. They embrace new ideas. They, they like to uh, investigate and, uh, and not only for new tools, but also for new legis legislation as well that will facilitate. Um, these uh, tools. Yes, I think that the Cyprus government has always been supportive in relation to, to, to new schemes and new ideas in order to facilitate the alleviation of the problem. And also correctly spotted mortgage to rent uh, is a new tool that has been tested in other jurisdictions like Ireland, whereby it is mostly addressed to borrowers that they are cooperative and non-viable and usually they are quite of, uh, 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 let's say, um, towards uh, their old age, whereby uh, they are, uh, the viability test is, is difficult and it is a solution in order to alleviate uh, housing, uh, housing issues. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michalis, for the useful presentation. I think it might be a good idea uh, if we can pass the floor to Nicolas in order to explain in more detail the litigation framework and the legal framework that is in place and how such framework can be used in order to facilitate recoveries because this will drive the values for investors, but also it, it, it will be good to also to know the recent developments that are taking place, which will be followed up with new, new legislation in the near future. We are aware that uh, the European uh, authorities are also taking steps in order to provide second chances to uh, to companies and to, to borrowers in order to recover also from uh, COVID-19 effects. And uh, we are aware that uh, the, the local legislators are trying to implement uh, the recent European directives in this perspective. But uh, COVID-19, it, it's a more of a short-term uh, issue rather than the long-term issues faced by the NPL problems that we have seen coming from 2013 uh, onwards. And as you have correctly spotted in your presentation, although a lot of these assets have been sold to credit acquiring companies, it is evident that a lot of them are still in the market. So I think a friendly legal framework will assist everybody to, to find and accommodate uh, appropriate solutions. Nicolas, please enlighten us with your feedback. Thank you very much, uh, Petros. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Mihalis, for the excellent and uh, insightful presentation. Um, a, few, a few words about uh, um, our law firm. Um, Harris Kiragidis has been in the market for 45 years. And uh, I, myself, uh, I am one of the partners in the uh, banking and finance uh, team. Um, we have had a lot of, um, you know, experience with uh, with NPLs in the past few years. We have we have been representing banks and uh, credit acquiring companies. Uh, we were involved in uh, both uh, Helix One and Helix Two, and uh, I, I think that this um, um, will go on for a few more years. I mean, the the NPL um, uh, situation. Um, so I'll share my screen one second. Uh, 
Um, so I, I thought that it would be a good idea to start from the options that uh, a financial institution, including credit acquiring uh, companies, have um, regarding recovery, recovery of NPLs. Uh, so the first and uh, obvious option is litigation and enforcement measures of a, of a court judgment. Secondly, uh, um, DFAS or consens consensual solutions with deb deb debtors, which include DFAS and uh, settlement agreements uh, or both. Uh, thirdly, uh, which is, um, I would say, the mo most... Um, um, frequent, frequently used nowadays uh, for closures, and um, um, finally enforcement of other collaterals such as um, um, you know claim under an assignment agreement uh, over receivables or the appointment of a receiver manager over a company or enforcement of uh, letters of guarantee. Um, so uh, I'm going to analyze a bit further. Um, for for aspects litigation for um, li litigation DFAS foreclosures and uh, e auctions that uh, um, Michalis mentioned earlier. Uh, so starting from litigation, um, start from litigation. Uh, generally, I would say that um, Cyprus. Um, I mean, the litigation in Cyprus. Uh, is quite time consuming uh, and um, uh, quite costly, I would say. Uh, on average, a legal case may, may take between four and six years to be uh, adjudicated on a first, a first instance basis. Uh, the reasons uh, for, for the delays uh, include, such as uh, in, in other jurisdictions, uh, include uh, <clears throat> that, uh, um, first of all, e-justice has not been, been implemented yet, uh, that the civil procedure rules are um, do not reflect the current economic, commercial, and social status of Cyprus, and that um, Cypriot courts are uh, quite understaffed. However, uh, we uh, were now uh, um, Cyprus is now amidst um, a major reform in its uh, justice system, which includes. Um, um, a, a complete reform of the civil procedure rules <clears throat> and uh, the court system in general, um, the, the creation of new and specialized courts such as commercial court uh, is being uh, contemplated, uh, the appointment of more judges, um, it has happened to, to an extent, um, and um, finally the uh, implementation of uh, e-justice, which is uh, going to happen uh, very soon. Um, moving on to uh, the DFAS option. Uh, DFAS goes for uh, debt for asset swap. Uh, it is an out-of-court settlement option between the credit institution and the, and the mortgage debtor. Um, whereby the mortgage property will be transferred in the name of the credit institution in consideration for reduction or settlement of the outstanding debt. Um, why is DFAS a good option? First of all, the mortgage property is transferred to the credit institution and the outstanding debt will be partially reduced or completely settled. Uh, usually, DFAS options will be accompanied by a small write-off on the outstanding debt by the credit institution in order to facilitate uh, an out-of-court settlement. Uh, secondly, uh, in case the parties elect to proceed with the DFAS option and the transaction uh, falls within the umbrella of restructuring, then the sale and purchase of immovable, immovable property will be exempted from, firstly, the liability of paying transfer fees and capital gain, gain tax, uh, and secondly, if VAT is applicable to the transaction, then uh, it is provided uh, by the legislation that um, um, th there might be a reversion of the VAT paid. Uh, thirdly, uh, DFAS is a flexible option uh, since the asset can be transferred to the credit institution directly 
or uh, it can be sold directly to a third party purchaser, uh, provided that the mortgage debtor and the credit institution are in agreement. In case of the second option, the exemptions uh, that were uh, just mentioned uh, apply. Um, also, it is, it is time and cost efficient. Usually the procedure that needs to be followed, uh, I would say this very briefly, a technical due diligence report is prepared, the mortgage debtor uh, of the credit institution, uh, subcontractors sub subcontractors will uh, collate all available documents regarding the asset. The credit institutions, legal advisors will prepare and negotiate the sale and purchase agreement between uh, the, the purchaser and the mortgage debtor. Uh, and after the finalization and execution of the sale uh, and purchase agreement, um, the agreements will need to get stamped um, and the vendor will need to obtain all uh, prerequisite clearances uh, for the transfer and thereafter the parties will uh, schedule a date uh, to go to the lender department. Um, now, why DFAS might not be a good option sometimes? Uh, firstly, a lot of assets onboarded by credit institutions are not marketable. Uh, or are not commercially viable uh, and therefore credit institutions will need a lot of time and resources in order to manage to dispose the assets. This is also connected with the fact that um, under uh, uh, the business of uh, credit institutions law of 1997, um, REOs can stay at the credit institution's ownership for three years only, unless the central bank approves an extension of such time, provided that, that uh, such extension is justified due to exceptional circumstances. And secondly, uh, certain cases can be time consuming and costly, and perhaps the credit institution will have been better off to proceed with other recovery methods, such as foreclosures, litigation, or uh, enforcement of uh, court proceedings. Uh, another, um, Another disadvantage is that the um, land registry department and tax authorities can cause uh, some delays. Um, uh, the, and this has uh, been uh, apparent during the, the pandemic, um, as uh, you know, both authorities could, uh, cannot serve the public remotely. Uh, secondly, uh, I mean, furthermore, the credit institutions need to implement and uh, find cost and time efficient ways to dispose assets. Um, and finally, the assets onboarded often have various legal and technical issues that need to be remedied by the credit institution uh, or the subsequent owner. Uh, moving on to foreclosures. If I've allowed it to say, Nicolas, um... DFAS is a tool that has been used extensively by the banks, although it has uh, certain pitfalls, as you have correctly uh, mentioned. But on the other hand, uh, in light of the fact that our court judicial system is going under reforms, the DFAS option, which is considered consensual, has been used extensively to reduce our MPL problems because it is a quick way of uh, handing over the ownership to the bank rather than going through a lot of court proceedings. And uh, also the borrower is alleviated for substantial debt. Uh, obviously, um, there might be certain issues with, uh, with the property, but this can be taken into account when a transaction takes place. And most importantly for our investors and our audience, uh, the Cyprus government has adopted a tax-free regime for such transactions in order to, to ensure not, uh, that not a tax burden is imposed either on banks or uh, on the investors in order to, to, to assist the whole process and not to increase debt, which at the end of the day might, might not be viable. So these are the, the key issues for someone to take into consideration. But obviously, for uh, other transactions where the borrowers are non, either non-viable or non-cooperative predominantly, I think the foreclosure topics that you're going to, to present, it's more relevant, and we are looking forward to hearing your views on this. 
Exactly, Petros, and thank you. Um, I, I mean, I don't have statistics, but uh, while uh, litigation was the most, uh, um, you know, um, frequently used uh, mechanism up to like three or four years ago, um, we have seen um, that DFAS and foreclosures have uh, been increasingly popular uh, during the past few years. So moving on to foreclosures. Um, the foreclosure process uh, through the transfer and mortgage of property law uh, of 1965 uh, is essential to reducing NPLs and uh, recovering the debt while enhancing the payment discipline and addressing strategic defaulters. Um, the provisions, uh, the relevant provisions of the law, uh, regulate the issuance um, and servicing of particular notices within a certain time frame. Uh, and generally regulate all the steps in the foreclosure process. Uh, the issuance of a court decision against the mortgagor or the borrower is not required in order to initiate a foreclosure procedure. Um, so in that sense, foreclosure is not a legal execution measure. Um, someone, I mean, a financial institution can proceed with the foreclosure process, even in the case uh, they have already obtained a court order for, for the sale of the, of the mortgage property. Um, a reform which uh, took effect in June last year, 2020, uh, when uh, um, the transfer mortgage of property law of, uh, of uh, uh, 20, 2019 was published and the, the previous law was amended, um, provides um, basically four, provided for basically four uh, changes. First, um, there was an extending, uh, there was an, uh, the time periods required um, uh, were extended uh, regarding, um, I mean, the time periods requiring, requiring action from a mortgage or in the mandatory notices uh, from 45 days sorry, from 30 days to 45 days. So this period was extended and uh, this uh, slightly delayed the foreclosure, uh, delays the foreclosure process. Secondly, an application to join the STIA scheme uh, or uh, uh, personal repayment plans is sufficient to suspend the foreclosure process. So we have seen uh, these being used by debtors quite uh, frequently. Thirdly, um, um, further, there was a further empowerment of the financial ombudsman to file uh, for a prohibitive order uh, where there has been a breach by a credit institution of the provisions of the code of conduct for the handling of borrowers. And uh, fourthly, if an interim injunction has been issued pending final determination of proceedings concerning the loan agreements in question, um, without the need um, um, without the need of providing uh, irreparable damage. So this, uh, uh, this option is now available for, for debtors. Uh, these changes appear to have a kind of uh, debtor-friendly provisions. However, they're deemed to contribute to the restructuring, uh, the restructuring of uh, viable borrowers and the settlement of their debt. Um, um, most recently, uh, in, um, uh, there was an increase in the, in the NPL ratio in 2021 uh, because of you know, the inability of borrowers who have been uh, significantly affected by, by the pandemic. Uh, and the latest re reform, uh, which took place a few weeks ago on uh, May the 7th, um, provided um, for a temporary suspension of the uh, foreclosures uh, uh, regime in four cases, in three cases, uh, until the end of July. So uh, for about two more months. And these three, um, these three cases are when the debtor's primary residence, um, um, a residence used by the owner and or his family members, and it is estimated. It's it's estimated values does not exceed. Uh, 500,000 euros. Secondly, the debtor's business premises, um, uh, 
which is property used by small size enterprises which have no more than 10 employees and with annual turnover not exceeding 2 million euros. And thirdly, the debtors um, agricultural fields, which are located in uh, an agricultural zone and its estimated value is less than 250,000. Uh, my last topic uh, that I would like to mention briefly uh, are e-auctions. So the e-auctions regime uh, was implemented in 2019 and uh, provide a more time and cost efficient way to conduct auctions and attract more interested buyers, both domestic and foreigners. Uh, e-auctions have been particularly useful now due to the pandemic and the measures implemented. Uh, specifically, as part of improving the effectiveness of the foreclosure regime, the um, House of Representatives voted an amendment to the legal framework on foreclosures, which enables the mortgagee to select to foreclose the mortgage property, either using physical auctions or using electronic online auctions. Uh, ha having said that, uh, on August uh, 2019, the sale of the mortgage property through electronic system auction order of 2019 was issued pers pursuant to the provisions of the, of the uh, transfer and mortgage of properties laws law of 1965 uh, with the purpose of introducing electronic auctions <clears throat> uh, of foreclosed property. Now pot potential bidders must uh, register in the uh, respective electronic platform and submit the required information in order to apply for participation in any auction without being um, physically present. And according to the, to the said law, the, pot the potential bidders must deposit to a mortgagee account held by the auction officer any relevant participation guarantee fee, which is usually calculated as a percentage of the starting bid. Uh, E-auctions have, have, have also been quite po popular lately, as I said mainly due to uh, COVID-19, but um, probably they will uh, um, continue being around. So that's all from me. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nicolas. Just a brief summary to, for our audience. I think that uh, uh, the, the, the authorities in Cyprus have been reactive uh, following the 2013 uh, events whereby they have amended the foreclosure law in order to facilitate the, the process because previously it will take much more time to foreclose. Uh, by putting the new law into place, we have seen that certain legal impediments have been created by the borrowers, whereby during the last enactment in 2020, a lot of legal impediment measures have been uh, taken out in order to, to allow for closures to, to take place. And as correctly spotted by Nicolas, I think it's important there, there is an adoption of the uh, electronic option tool in order to address the COVID uh, effects and uh, all the administrative issues which someone can sell and, and uh, or obviously to buy a property via a platform that obviously needs to apply beforehand and, and establish uh, a valid uh, subscription. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nicolas, and uh, your presentation has been uh, very enlightening. We, we move to our last speaker, uh, Evdogia. Evdogia has considerable experience in, in fund management, and she will go through uh, fund management structures that are available based on current local legislation that will allow interested parties to, to invest in, in Cyprus and, and use the framework to, to, to invest into uh, various NPL structures. Evdogia. Thank you. Thank you, Petros. Uh, thank you to Mihalis and Nicolas for a very enlightening uh, presentation regarding the NPL and the legislation behind uh, this is a very interesting chapter nowadays. Um, we hear, I mean, we heard from uh, Michalis as well as Nicolas that um, funds are more actively now involved um, in this uh, type of uh, business, sort of. So we see with um, Helix as well as Pinko, uh, large uh, funds acquiring bulk uh, portfolios 
of NPLs and using the fund structuring uh, process to to, um, um, to to basically invest in those projects and get a gain out of it for their own investors. So before I go into my presentation, just allow me one minute to, to present myself. Um, I am a director in Alderdomos based in Cyprus. I am, uh, I've been in Alderdomos for six years and I'm dealing with corporate and fund administration services. I also head the Israeli desk of Alderdomos. I'm a qualified accountant uh, as a background. And uh, prior to AD, I was in a big four firm for many years handling uh, audits and corporate services. Um, in Alderdomos, we are 3,000 people globally. We are 45 in Cyprus, across 20 countries. And the main line of business that we do is fund administration, fund management in, in some countries, like in Luxembourg and Ireland, and uh, as well as other services such as depository domiciliation, um, loan management agency services in US. Um, we are lucky to serve 16 out of 20 largest private equity houses 17 out of 20 largest real estate firms uh, and 17 out of 20 largest private debt managers. And the total value of our clients uh, is more than 1 trillion of assets under administration that we do. We have an office in Cyprus the last 10 years and we do fund administration services, as I said, and corporate services. So moving on, um, we we have the infrastructure in Cyprus in order to accommodate uh, funds. We have a very strong legislation locally. Uh, we have the so-called AIF law, Alternative Investment Fund law. Uh, and we have three types of products that one can use. And um, I will just attempt to share my screen for a second, which will assist us um, in presenting the three, three type of funds. Okay, um, so uh, you can see the, the, the three type of funds that we have. It's the AIF, the RAIF, and the AIF with a limited number of persons. Uh, in Cyprus, we have seen a large uh, increase in demand for funds, especially during the last three years. Uh, the reason is that there was an enhancement in the law, uh, and there's also, uh, there was also this introduction of this new product the so-called drive, the registered fund, which doesn't need licensing. So one can set up a fund in less than two months. I would say even uh, in one month, one can have a fund, but that specific type of fund needs to have a regulated manager, which provides the, reg the regulation to, to the fund. So very quickly, I will not go into all the points that I have here on, on the screen. Um, the, the AIF needs licensing as well as the AIF with limited number of persons, right? We already talked about. Uh, it is addressed, the AIF is addressed to retail as well as professional and well-informed investors, while the other two are only addressed to professional and well-informed investors. There is a minimum capital requirement of 125,000 for AIF, 50,000 for AIF LNP, which is the last uh, on our chart, the, the AIF with limited number of persons, persons I mean. And there's no minimum capital for RAIF because that is covered by the manager. Um, all three types can be open-ended or close-ended. All three types can also be um, umbrella funds. When we would talk a bit about that because it's a very useful tool, a useful structure to accommodate different strategies like real estate, private equity in the same structure, uh, which will give us some flexibility. Um, there are unlimited number of, of uh, investors, except in the, in the last one, which says uh, in its title as well that it is limited in number of persons, so a maximum 50. And there is uh, the requirement of externally or internally managed in the, the two types, except drive, which needs to have an external manager by, by definition. All three types need a depository, except in certain cases, like in the case of I with limited number of persons, which um, basically uh, in certain conditions can uh, be uh, exempted from having a depository provided the, the local regulator, which is the Cyprus Securities and Exchange Commissions, allows that. Um, moving on to the next slide, uh, we can see 
here a, a structure of a fund. Uh, this AIF this that it says in the middle can be an AIF, a RAIF, or an AIF with a limited number of persons. We see the, the fund manager, central administration, which, what, which is what we do in, in Cyprus, in Alderton Cyprus, depository, and we see the various investments uh, below that. So this type of structure can, on, can also be structured in a way to um, become an umbrella fund. And what do we mean with that? We mean umbrella fund with separate uh, compartments. So it could have compartment one, compartment two, and compartment three. The benefit of having these three compartments is that each compartment has its own documentation, uh, meaning the, the private press memorandum that it has, different strategy, a different investors. So uh, it gives the flexibility to investors to invest in different type of strategies. And it also makes the fund more attractive uh, for, for investors to come into the, the, the structure. The other very important thing is that each compartment is treated like a separate legal entity, even though it is within the same entity. Uh, each compartment has its own tax identification number and it can be closed off, dissolved independently from the other compartments. So giving a, an example, which can also be linked to the real estate business that we're talking now, if you have compartment one dealing in real estate and uh, you decide um, a life of this, of this compartment of five to 10 years, for example, you can have your investors investing in this specific compartment. It has its own expenses, its own income. There is no blocking of dividends. So if this compartment is fully profitable and you have a newly set up compartment here, which is um, now at the beginning, it has, doesn't have any profits and maybe it has some loss, this will not be an obstacle for the first compartment to distribute dividends to the investors and eventually close off without affecting any of the other compartments. So this is the umbrella fund, which uh, is quite popular in Cyprus and it's been used uh, actively. We've seen an increase in, um, in the request for funds the last three years uh, of more than 120%. Yes, Cyprus is small, the numbers are small, but it has the correct legislation and infrastructure to accommodate this type of, of funds. And we see uh, large funds uh, starting to be interested in Cyprus because Cyprus is an EU country. It has a legal framework. It has the professional uh, personnel, uh, qualified accountants, experts in the fee in law, as well the lawyers and all the experts in real estate and other areas that are relevant to, to this industry. Uh, so one can achieve the same um, results, even better in certain cases, at a reduced cost. So investing, uh, setting up a Cyprus fund, getting advantage of the double tax treaties that we have, which are more than 60, uh, is definitely, Cyprus is definitely a, an alternative to any other EU jurisdiction. So we are new in the market. We started actively to get into, into this and we hope we are successful. We do have the infrastructure and all the things in place and I think it's gonna work. So um, maybe Petros, I'll move on a bit on the, on the taxes. You, you're laughing, you want to say something. <laughs> I, I, I am laughing because I, I have opened today the TV and I've seen that the European authorities are trying to adopt uh, a uniform tax regime in order to, to uh, unite uh, the, the tax regime in the various European countries. Obviously, this will create some disturbance in the market because borrowers, investors have set up various tax structures in order to, to take advantage of uh, uh, various tax jurisdictions for obvious reasons. But uh, on the other hand, uh, I don't know how well, how quick this will take place because each jurisdiction has its own merits based on the services and uh, uh, other things being, being offered. Uh, obvious uh, and correctly spotted the idea, uh, Cyprus being a European country, uh, has aligned its uh, legislation, especially in the fund uh, management business, 
uh, a lot and to, we are following closely the, the, the European authorities' directives and I think for some interested parties to, to join Cyprus and invest, it's a good opportunity because the costs that are involved are not the same or even lower in most of the cases compared to, to other European jurisdictions. But uh, uh, obviously, it always depends from the, the, the topic. And the topic that we are discussing today, NPLs, I think it's, a, it's an interesting topic because it takes into account the, the local expertise and uh, the local know-how, whereby we have uh, the, the, the local borrowers, the banking institutions, and the, the local tools. As Michalis mentioned, it seems that we have some way to go, although uh, various steps have been taken into the right direction, whereby uh, uh, we have a lot of transactions that uh, assets have been sold to credit acquiring companies. Still, the problem remains, and I think services will be here for some time in order to, to negotiate with borrowers and find uh, amicable solutions. And for those cases that amicable solutions cannot be found, Nicolas had uh, placed the issues in the right directive whereby we we are going to see foreclosures. Uh, it's, it's, it's predominantly uh, eminent that we are going to see foreclosures because uh, foreclosures is, is a tool used to, to bring people at the, the table of the negotiations and uh, also uh, to find uh, acceptable solutions. Uh, I expect that the mortgage to rent, as Michal has mentioned, to be, to be a product to, to go in the, in the market soon in order to, to take into account the non-viable cooperative uh, borrowers. And uh, I expect that more of fund structures will, will also be in place to, to accommodate uh, all these investment opportunities. I don't know if uh, uh, you would like to make a closing statement starting from Evdogia and going to our other presenters in order to close this interesting uh, session. Evdogia. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, yeah, uh, to conclude, there are, uh, as I said, the infrastructure is there, the legislation is there. Uh, we expect to see more funds set up in Cyprus for real estate business, as well as for other uh, type of business, private equity infrastructure. Um, the fact that um, the, the, the benefits from tax, on, especially on funds, uh, can bring uh, the vast majority of funds to pay 0% tax. And the reason is that the disposal of shares is free of tax and the dividend distribution, there's no withholding tax. And also there is this attractive um, benefit for, for employees and management of the management of the fund management company to pay to pay only 8% of tax from their income on the income that they generate from carried interest and variable remuneration. Uh, that makes uh, Cyprus very attractive uh, in the long run and in the short run. So we, we wait to see and we hope to, to have a more quick turnaround of things and improve the picture even better. Thank you, Evdogia. Um, I agree with uh, Evdogia, of course. Um, I think um, Cyprus is uh, an attractive jurisdiction for uh, investors in, in, in the area of NPLs. Despite our problems, um, I think we're trying to improve. Uh, we have the professionals, we have the infrastructure, and now with, um, um, with the COVID-19 period, there was you know, a huge uh, drive towards the use of technology, which is something that helps uh, uh, a lot in the area. So I'm quite optimistic as well. Excellent. Michalis, I think the real estate market in Cyprus has always been a hot topic. <laughs> and I course. think it's an area that you, you are being engaged. So your closing statement, please. Um, as my fellow speakers uh, expertly covered uh, the infrastructure and the legislation, we also see a positive uh, outlook in the real estate market. Um, certainly, we ha we've had the COVID um, uh, effect, 
but uh, we even even through covid and even through the difficulties we've seen a large number of sales we see um, local investors with uh, low leveraging uh, investing in cyprus properties we expect that on the second half of 2021 uh, given that the covid situation will be under control um, we will have foreign investors uh, returning as well and uh, regarding the cyprus in economy in general we see uh, I, i would like to reiterate the the importance of uh, the government understanding the issue and realizing trying to to raise its level um, and realizing that the first um, things that they should uh, consider are the restructuring uh, of the, the private debt and the non performing exposures and we we've seen a lot of uh, positive interest from from the government regarding this excellent the second semester i think it's going to be interesting following the vaccination of the majority of the population i think we expect a, a higher growth rate in this respect thank you very much everybody and i would like to thank also our audience for being patient with us thank you thank you thank you petros and panelists um Uh, discussion. It was uh, certainly good to hear from from all of you who are uh, closely involved in this market, which is always a great interest to to ourselves and to the audience. So uh, we appreciate um, all the insights and uh, hope to meet you in person at the next event. Thank you, everybody. Be a pleasure. Thank you very much, Martin. Be a pleasure to see you again. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.